This is Yalak, and this is March 2nd, 2019. This week's lesson is titled, A Holy Offering. I just came across this and wanted to share it when dealing with the sacrifices. Because that verse came across my mind that says, The Most High was asking for sacrifices and uh, if he wanted all these animals he would have he wouldn't let you know it so i find it a bit strange that people were offering these animals to the lord now we know that in ancient times animals were offered as sacrifices to the gods of people who by biblical standards, were not Israelites. They were not chosen by the Most High. And as I've pointed out on so many of my lessons, the whole thing seems strange when you understand that the Torah is telling you that Israel is being told to do the same religious practices and rituals that the other nations who did not know God were doing. So now, like the other nations, you know, like the Hamite nations, for example, were offering sacrifices unto their gods. And they were bringing these animals as worship to their gods. And many of you know, in apocryphal writings, it is said that Abraham knocked down the, destroyed the, idols of his father when he was feeding them this particular time relating to this lesson here he destroyed them and told his father that i think there wasn't enough food or something like that he said and they got fighting over the food and basically destroyed themselves but as we can see abraham did not know the lord at that point and I find something very strange, you know, how this whole deception about the Torah is made up. Because they told us that Torah instructions was passed on from the Garden of Eden and from Adam's time and so on to Cain and Abel. They would have known it, or at least to Abel, but it seems to both Cain and Abel and uh, I guess his other children. And that there was this godly line and it was passed on. And they have this... Um, I think mnemonic formula where they take the names of the different people earlier in the Bible and they show how when you mention each name of each person early from Genesis coming on down starting with Adam and going on then it the meaning of all the names when added together point to Jesus Christ so you can accept his Calvary sacrifice but Look at that now. If, if they use stuff like that and also say that Abraham was taught by an angel sent by God the whole Torah again and the, the laws and the statutes again and so on, then it's a bit strange because they were telling us all along that there was an unbroken line of chosen people from Adam and uh, I guess Abel and the rest of them that came on right and Enoch and all them and it came down so if it, it's like if it's coming down why is God destroying the line he's preserving in a flood how how would it have been lost in the flood so that Abraham would need to be taught it again God is preserving this knowledge and you mean all the people on the boat don't preserve it so that God has to send an angel to teach Abraham later on. He chose Noah for a reason, because Noah seemed to have been set apart, and it said he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it's clear that the God of Israel is preserving not just the line of people on the boat, who who was pure, uh, because they're telling us that basically Noah was pure in his lineage, but he would have also been pure in his knowledge of the Torah. Why is God saving someone who is Torah-less or has no Torah knowledge? 
So even in Christianity, you find that it being builded on the Old Testament, so they want us to believe, is telling you that as the Apostle Paul said, the Old Testament was written for our understanding. So then they're trying to let you know that there is no break there. There's a seamless connection between the Old and the New Testament. But that could only be possible if there was a preservation. So if you're going on the ark and you are Noah and you're pure in your lineage, you would then be pure in your knowledge of God in order to be saved. That's the reason why Adam was not saved in the garden or Eve, because they were no longer pure in the garden, so they were kicked out or they were unsaved or not saved. Because they did not preserve the Torah in their mind, which then means in their heart, and that would lead to in their practices, then they were no longer pure in the knowledge of Torah, in the ways of Torah, so they lost it, which is a reason why people say they were lost, or you are lost, or you are a sinner. So if Adam and Eve were not saved because they were kicked out of the garden, they were rejected by God, then that means they lost out with Torah, or they lost the Torah, which is the same thing that happened with Israel. When they were kicked out of the land into captivity, being punished, it was because they were not saved by the Torah. They did not have the Torah in their heart. They were not saved. But then he would offer salvation a later time when he brought them back to their land. But as long as that judgment is coming, they were not saved. So Adam was not saved. He didn't have Torah. Now, how is God saving Noah on the ark if Torah was not being saved on the ark with the people? Because you cannot have salvation without the Torah or without the word. That's why you hear talk in the Bible, Old and New Testament, with words like the saving, uh, sorry, the washing of the word which means that the Torah is washing you or making you clean or it is saving you. So if Noah was pure in his generations and therefore pure by his knowledge and living of the Torah, that would be the only way that he could have been saved because you can't be saved by anything other than Torah. So if he was saved... On the boat, that's Noah, he would have come off being saved. Why is it that the Torah that was preserved was lost and needed to be taught by, not by a man, but by an angel to, to Abraham? See, the whole thing is strange. Something is wrong somewhere. Torah cannot be lost on earth because Torah, sorry, earth cannot function without Torah. That's why the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, when you come to the proper understanding of that, the heavens declare the Torah of the Lord because the Lord cannot be revealed in nature or in the heavens and cannot be declared by the heavens or in the heavens without Torah doing that declaration. So the heavens declare the Torah of God. There can never be a time when Torah is lost because Torah is always declaring. So at what point do we start to understand that it is a great deception to say that Torah knowledge was lost so an angel had to come and teach it back to Abraham? You see how many false teachings are in this Israelite stuff? People are making fools of us. Torah cannot be lost. And if you say, well, he just, he was living it in his heart, but he just didn't have the copy of it because it was lost. Then was it written before Mount Sinai? The next thing is, if like the New Testament is telling you that the law should really be in your heart, then if Abraham was already living it in his heart or in his life, but just didn't have the written copy, why would an angel need to come back and teach him something that he was already living, which means he already knew it? She wasn't teaching him for him to write it down because was Abraham greatly credited with writing the Torah or is that credited to Moses? But even so, if you say Abraham wrote some stuff, then 
what is the point of an angel being dispatched to teach or reteach Abraham the lost Torah if you're telling me that he Abraham was already living it? He just didn't have the written copy of it. Because if the man was living it, but the angel just wants him to have the written copy, why bother? Because if the aim of Torah, just like in New Testament thought, would be for you to have the stuff in your heart, then if the man is already living it in his heart, what's the big deal with God sending an angel to teach the man something to write down when he already has normalized it by living it day to day in his life? You don't need a book anymore. You don't need teachings anymore because you have gotten to the place where you are living out the Torah on earth. So you don't need an angel to teach you. So it is a lie. That angel came to teach Abraham this Torah. Because they want you to think that Torah came from heaven. It did not. It came from men who made this book up. But as these men were offering a holy offering each time they did it to the Lord, the same way the heathen nations were offering their holy offerings of animals unto their gods as well, even the Sumerians, the Egyptians, everybody else was doing it. And... Uh, they were just offering these sacrifices unto their gods, right? These animal offerings. Then it's kind of strange because look at this. You teach that the Torah says that God said to offer these things. Like in Leviticus chapter 11, you're finding... Like in verse 2, Leviticus 11, 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. And that eating of it goes along with the sacrifices being offered to the Most High. Because a part of animal sacrifice was eating the animal before the gods. That's how the nations were doing it before there was anything called Israel on earth. And then if you look in Leviticus 23 with the, the different feasts, speak verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. And he goes on to explain the feast, right? So basically, they're going to start this fire in a, as a part of a holy convocation and kill these animals and offer them up to the Lord, this lamb and so on, right? Uh, like verse 12, and ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So they're offering these animals unto the Lord. But look at what Psalm chapter 50 verse 12 is saying. Because you're telling me that the Lord in those scriptures is asking you or telling you to offer these things to him, to bring these things, which is how um, the other nations did it. They said their God wanted them to bring these animals that they offered. But Psalm 50 verse 12 says, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. So how come he is telling them in these places like Leviticus 11, Leviticus 23 and other places to offer these foods so that he could eat them? Because the sacrifices were offered for God to eat them. Now, the other nations were offering them to their gods as food for the gods to eat. Which is why they made fun in that apocryphal story that said Abraham said, well, they were fighting over the food. Because that's what was going on. Clearly showing me that Abraham didn't have no teaching from no Hebrew doctrine passed on from the patriarchs to him. Or why would he have been worshipping idols in his father's house? You tell me Abraham wasn't an idol worshipper. His father Tyr was an idol worshipper. He was worshipping an idol too. He was feeding gods. That's idol worship. Abraham was an idolater. Before he switched over to this other idolatrous worship. That might sound offensive, but he's using idolatrous practices such as offering sacrifices unto God. So he is still an idolater. He's just doing it with Yahweh this time. Because Yahweh worshippers, just like you'll hear them sometimes call it the cult of Yahweh, they were doing idolatrous rituals unto Yahweh. So what really is set apart about this Yahweh worship, this Hebrew Israelite worship? But he could not have told you to offer these things. Because he said, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. 
And so, because Yahweh does not eat animals, then the people of Israel themselves ate the animals. But in effect, they were really offering it to him to eat the same way that the people in the other religions would offer to their gods, but because their gods could not eat as well, then the people ate them, the priests and everybody else in those other religions. So it's the same thing pretty much as the Yahweh Hebrew Israelite religion. Both the pagan, although no pagan is not a proper word to use here, because pagan is just kind of a way to tell you that the real things of Africa um, should be seen as unrighteous, so they call it pagan. But anyway, we go ahead here because you understand how it is generally used nowadays. So the pagan nations were offering animals to their gods, but their gods could not eat because they were not real people. So the people making the offerings ate them themselves. So in the end, they offered animals to be eaten by their gods, but the people, the worshippers, ate it instead. Well, when you come to the Yahweh set-apart religion, the Israelites offered unto God, but because God does not eat it, then the worshippers of the Most High, or the Israelites, turned around and ate it themselves. What's the difference between them and the pagans? And the Hamites that they curse out? What's the difference? They bo both gods, the God of Israel and the gods of the other nations, ended up not eating the stuff, but the worshippers ate it. So you see, there's really no difference, except that with the gods of the other nations, you can see them because most times they're made of wood and stone, but with the God of Israel, you cannot see him, but he ends up doing the same thing, which is not eating it the same way, the pagan gods did not eat it. But he said, I would not tell thee if I were hungry, for the world is mine. In other words, when he says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee, he's letting you know, I've never given you any commandment to bring sacrifices before me of animals and lambs, because I would not tell you to bring food to feed me, religiously or anyway, because Offering food to gods was for them to eat it. And I would not tell you that because if I needed food to eat, if I had desire to eat food, I would never disclose it to you. So how come it's disclosed in Leviticus 23? These are the feasts of the Lord. How come he discloses it there? If I were hungry, I would not declare it. I would not cause it to be prophesied. So how come a prophet like Moses and others come prophesying to you that God said to offer these sacrifices, to bring these animals before him? If I were hungry, if I had desire like that, I would not let it be found out. In other words, if I were hungry, if I desired animal sacrifices, I would not reveal it to you so you would get no such revelation through any Hebrew prophet or anyone because that kind of revelation of my desire for animal flesh would never be told to man, not even a Hebrew Israelite. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. Go look it up, Psalm 50 and verse 12, and begin to be honest with yourself instead of just trying to be honest with your religion. So he would not disclose it to anyone. So I don't know how you get that a prophet disclosed it to you when God would not have spoken to that prophet. So when you read now, like Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, where it says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. When you read stuff like that, you understand that that could not have come from the God of Israel because it contradicts Psalm 50 verse 12, who they say was David writing this, because the prophet cannot speak a word to you that would contradict the ways of God or the way that God is. And the way that he is 
says, if I were hungry, I would not give such revelation. I would not tell thee. So a prophet would never hear from God that you should bring these food because if he is hungry, in other words, if I were hungry means if it ever comes down to, to, um, animal sacrifices, I would never tell you to bring any because I would never tell you any such thing. I would not let you know that I have such desire. I would not let you know that I have such a need because the world is mine and the fullness thereof. So I wouldn't let you know that I was in lack like that, that I was hungry. Look here now. Normally when you read the commenters and you read the different versions, it's going to tell you it just like it sounds right there, right? But look at Eliot's commentary for English readers for Psalm 50 verse 8. Now, which, let me read that for you. Hold on. Where it says here, Psalm 50 verse 8, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. And I always wondered why it sounded so confusing. Because it sounds like he's saying, I'm not going to chastise you or reprove you, correct you for your offering of sacrifices. So they word it like that to make it sound confusing. So you will continue to think that God is all right with animal sacrifices. But look here at how this other person puts it, which is in line with the, the other precepts that I've given to you so far in this and other lessons where I just mentioned to you that he would not have asked for this kind of stuff. Eliot's, sorry, Ellicott's commentary for English readers says, I will not, but he's saying better understood this way, not an account of thy sacrifices do I reprove thee, nor thy burnt offerings which are always before me. This part of the nation is judged not for neglect of ritual, but for mistaken regard for it. So, so basically he's saying they are judged not for neglecting it because the, the, the normal reading of it and understanding makes you think that the Most High is mad that they're not offering sacrifices to him enough when it's due because, you know, they have gone astray. But rather he's saying here that instead they are being judged for mistakenly regarding that God wants the sacrifices. So the judgment is coming upon them saying, you, you are misguided in your thinking that I want this kind of animal sacrifice ritual. You see that? So this holy offering of animals to the Lord is a mistaken um, teaching. Basically, the way he's putting it here. So, so if somebody else can see it like this, why do we continue to go with the regular approved animal sacrifices? When I just read you precept as well, that says, if I were hungry, I would not even let you know. So how could God have let you know that you should bring sacrifices? So it makes more sense, according to Ellicott's commentary, that God is really saying your animal sacrifice is a mistaken thing. In other words, you should not have been doing it. That's why I'm reproving you over the animal sacrifices. Because you're doing it saying that I told you that, but I already told you I would never have disclosed to you that I have need of such things. Because the other nations do that. Now look here in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 6. Sacrifice an offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Does that not go along with Psalm 50 verse 8 that I just read? That says, basically, he's telling the nation that they are misguided in their offering of sacrifices to him. And also with Psalm 50 verse 12 that says he would not even let them know about bringing animal sacrifice to him because if he were hungry like the other gods, he wouldn't even let it be known because he's not going to need food and let you know that he needs that. He's like, look, if I had such need, I wouldn't even tell you. So where are you getting this 
kind of stuff. This, this doctrine telling me that my prophet told you that I said that you should offer these sacrifices to feed me. Because animal sacrifices were to feed the gods. Sacrifices and offering thou did not um, desire. Mine ears as thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. So he did not require animal sacrifices. So he sure not going to require flesh at Calvary either. But no Hebrew Israelite sacrifice in the entire Torah was requested or commanded by the Most High. And you see, what I've told you before, they double up thing. They give you something that shows that God wants the thing and then another scripture that says he doesn't want it then another one says that he wants it then another one says that he doesn't want it then another one and they go back and forth like that i've covered that before already right um because it, that's just the way the book is written to confuse you so it is not a book of wisdom really because it is not a book of truth it is a book of confusion that does not give you wisdom but the only way that you would find wisdom is by coming to the understanding that wisdom is not locked up in a book, but it is by the searching in the heart. I look at Psalm 51 verse 19, Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices. No, 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 not that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall thy, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. So here, like the back and forth I told you, he is telling them that there will come a point when the Most High is pleased, and then they'll offer the sacrifices. But he just told you that in no way would the same God desire sacrifice. He just told you that. In Psalm 40, verse 6. And this is the same David, the psalmist, who's going to tell you that on another point, it is good to offer. You see, it's all confusion. It, it is just deception. And then he goes on again now. In Psalm 51, verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. So you see the doubling up of stuff? Yet it says line should be upon line and, and, and so on. Which means the stuff should agree. But these are completely two different instructions. So he says here, For thou desirest not sacrifice. He does not desire it. So if he does not desire it, then he says or else I would give it. So how come now the same psalmist now can say in three verses later in Psalm 51, 19, then shalt thou be pleased with it when he just told you three verses earlier that he does not delight in it. But now he's telling you then he's going to be pleased with it. And and burnt offering and so on and, 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 and so on. When he's just telling you in Psalm 51, 16, if he knew that the Most High desires sacrifice, then he would give it. There is no straight path with David or any of these prophets. They go back and forth, they contradict their own words. And I remember when I first saw this after coming into the Hebrew Israelite stuff, you know, like three or so years ago, I was very confused. And um, I'm tired of that confusion. They're, the same man is giving two different instructions that I should offer, but then he gives strong words saying, God doesn't even desire this, because if I knew you desired it, then I would give it. So at his age, he never knew all along Israelite teaching that God requires this or does not require this, and out of his own mouth, both instructions come that God does not require it, both teachings come that God does not require it and also that God does require it. So then they will offer up the bullocks at a certain point. Study. There should never come a point 
if it is true that he wants sacrifices, that David should have said that he does not desire it and he does not want it. They shall never come that point. Something is wrong with the book.